Parsha's bow discusses the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh, the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people. As the famous Rashi in the beginning of Parsha's Bereshis, Rashi asks, why doesn't the Torah begin, if the whole purpose of the Torah is mitzvahs, is doing the commandments, would it make sense for the Torah to get right down to business? Let's discuss the mitzvahs, the commandments. So why does the Torah go into the whole Sefer Bereshis, the book of Bereshis, and the first couple of parashos in Shmos until they finally get to the first mitzvah, according to uh, Rashi. And, the, and Rashi answers, the famous answer, Koach Ma'is of Higiliyamo, that first we have to know our potential. You could have all... You, if someone has diamonds buried in the backyard, but they think they're glass, so they're useless. If you don't know the value, so first we have to go through, go through the others, how great a person can become, an Avram Avinu, Yitzchak, a Yaakov, a Sarah. And on the other hand, you could be like Anshay Sodom and Amora. So if one has to know the full potential, and once they know what they can and can't do, then they can use the Torah to attain their goals. And what do you mean it's the first mitzvah given in the Torah? We find other mitzvahs in Seif Abrashis, Pru Ravu, having children, Bris Mila, Gitan Asha. So Rashi means it's the first mitzvah given to Kla Yisrael. It's the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people. Up until now, they were given to Yechidim, to individuals, to Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. We had the seven mitzvahs, B'nai Noach, six to Adam, one to Noach. But it's the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people as, as, as Klai Yisrael, as a nation. And that's why Rashi says it's the first mitzvah. Why was this mitzvah chosen to be the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people? You couldn't find a better mitzvah? So the commentators explain it because this is the mitzvah of time, sanctifying time. And we know the different levels of Kedusha we have. We have Kedusha's Hamakam, sanctity of place, the Beis HaMikdash, the Shul, Kedusha's Hazman, Yantif, Shabbos, sanctifying time. And of course, Kedusha, our selves, were Gufe Kedusha. So the first thing now, up, up until now, we've been slaves for for 210 years in Egypt and we're about to go free so one thing a slave doesn't have you don't control your own time whatever the ma- your master tells you to do you get, it says to get up at 3 in the morning you get up, do this, do that how high should I jump basically you don't really think and you don't, hit, you don't really control your own destiny as much as a person can of course everything's Totally be Yad HaKadosh Baruch. Of course, everything's in the hands of God, but He leaves different things in our hands as well. So when you're free, you have a choice, you have the ability to choose. So, so therefore, God waited for the mitzvah of Kiddush HaKodesh, which sanctified time until the Jewish people are about to become free. Because when you're slaves, it's not too meaningful. In fact, that's why he also explained in Medrash that... Um, the Yerushalmi says he taught the Jewish people about the mitzvah of Shiluach Avadim, about, about the mitzvah of sending away, sending free, sending slaves to go free. And the question is, why are they telling it to us now? We are slaves ourselves. We don't have any slaves. Like the, like the question, why does Parashat Mishpatim begin with Evid Ivri? How to treat an Evid Ivri? How to treat a servant if... We, that's one that's one mitzvah we should know how to do. We just went from 210 years in severe slavery and persecution, so you would think that's one mitzvah we know how to do. And that's what the uh, Mepharshim point out. No, human psychology is just the opposite. It's you feel you might feel it's payback time. I went through this. Now I'm going to treat my slave even worse than I was treated. We see it all the time with the different revolutions. They say. You know what? Well, we're going to uproot. We're going to take over the this tyrant. And what happens 99% of the times is the people take over.
become worse than the ones who were there originally. And therefore, because that's just the human psychology. And that's why now when you're feeling what it is to be a slave, now the Torah tells us about, now the Yushami tells us, the Torah is telling us about how to treat slaves. Now is the time when you know, say, when you yourselves are feeling it, that's the time it's most meaningful. Like the famous story with Rav Yisrael Salanter. Rav Yisrael Salanter, he was, used to go around collecting money for his, for his yeshivas and other good causes. So one time it was the winter, cold winter in Europe, and he went to a gvir, one of these wealthy people, and he was outside on the porch, and he wouldn't come in to the gvir. The wealthy individual came in, didn't want to leave him alone, he came out, and he was getting cold, so he said, why don't you come inside, why, don't we, why are we talking outside? So he said, yeah, I just want you first to feel what it's like, the cold of the winter, poor people don't have a coat, they're cold out, I want you to feel the desire of your friends, and now I see you're ready, now we can go inside. That was the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu, that was a mistake Paro made, Paro thought, you know what, Sheva Levi didn't work, and Moshe Rabbeinu, who was brought up in the palace of Egypt, he didn't have to work, so he doesn't know exactly what it is to be a slave, and he's not going to feel for the Jewish people. And Moshe Rabbeinu was able to rise above, even though he himself didn't go through the slavery, he was able to rise to the level and to able to feel for those people and act accordingly. In fact, that's why it says later on, it says, Az Yavdiya, the mitzvah, Moshe Rabbeinu was given the mitzvah to set apart some Are Miklat. Are Miklat are different, different places of when a person's on the run and someone's on to, out to kill them, there's a place where they could hide in the Are Miklat and stay there. So why was it, why was Moshe Rabbeinu being busy with the Ari Mikla? So a simple explanation is because always mitzvahs go yispah mitzvahs. Moshe Rabbeinu was always putting himself in a situation to do more mitzvahs. Like it was with Eretz Yisrael, that Moshe was a mitzvah, he didn't want to enter the land. Moshe Rabbeinu was a he he wanted to enter the land of Israel so he could fulfill the mitzvahs atru yispah aret, so he could fulfill the certain special mitzvahs that only apply in Israel. Why was he mitzvah? He couldn't fulfill the mitzvah. So if he couldn't fulfill it, what's the big deal? It's not my fault. But no, he wanted, he had so much pain that he wanted to be able to put it in a situation where he could fulfill more mitzvahs. So Moshe also, by the Ari Mikha, wanted to do more mitzvahs. Only mitzvahs go yispa mitzvahs. So we find Moshe Rabbeinu as well, when everyone else was collecting the bizoi, the, the, all the booty from the leftover from Egypt, so Moshe Rabbeinu was busy, involved in the mitzvah of of the bones of Atzimos Yosef, because he was someone who was involved in the mitzvah. And that's the whole concept of why we wear tzitzis today. Even though tzitzis, strictly speaking, if you're not wearing a four-cornered garment, you're exempt. And it used to be during those days, on you used to wear four-cornered garments, so you put tzitzis on. But Bizman has said, nowadays, most of, our, most of our garments are not four-cornered, and really there's no, strictly speaking, there's no obligation to wear stitches, yet the minig of Chai Yisrael is we all are zealous and put on wear stitches all the time because we want to put ourselves in a situation where we can fulfill as many mitzvahs as possible. And that's what um, we learned from Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's why Moshe Rabbeinu was able to be nosi o he was able to feel the, the pain of Fellow, fellow Jews, he, even though he himself was not in Egypt himself as a slave, he was uh, he was a master. He was in Paro's home, and in fact, that's the famous Evan Ezra. Why wasn't? Why did Moshe have to be brought up in the palace of Paro? Why not be brought up as a slave in Egypt like everyone else? And therefore, he know what the Jewish people are feeling. And maybe he'd be a better leader. So the Mepharshim, the commentators point out twofold. The one is we see Rabos Machshavas Belevish. Many are the thoughts of man, but ultimately God gets the last laugh. That the irony is that that Paro makes a decree that all the male children should be thrown into the sea because he knows that his astrologers tell him that the 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 one who's going to save the Jewish people is around, and yet he himself 
brings up Moshe in his own palace. And, and, a more, and another explanation of a more of a psychological approach is it never would have worked. As we all know, someone who, who was brought up in a certain town and then he leaves and he becomes to a very prominent position, when he goes back home, he's still just one of the guys. And he doesn't have that same respect that he should have because people know him as a kid. The similar here, Moshe Rabbeinu was brought up as a slave. He'd just be one of the boys, so to speak, and he wouldn't demand the respect that an outsider, a stranger, gets. And therefore, God specifically maneuvered it that he was brought up in the house of Paro in order, number one, that he wouldn't be one of the boys. And of course, as well, to learn the leadership quality because if you have a slave mentality, you're not going to know how to lead. As, that's what, as the evidence says, that was the mistake the Jews had even when they left. They still kept that slave mentality. But Moshe Rabbeinu never had the slave mentality. He was never a slave. And therefore, he was chosen um, to be a leader. Of course, the reason why he was chosen as a leader, the Torah doesn't tell us explicitly, but we see from the different incidents in, in the beginning of Shmos that we see he's involved in helping people. There were, there were, um, there were two Jews... Um, a fighting with one another and Moshe interceded. There was Jew and Guy, a Jew and a Gentile were fighting and Moshe got involved. And also at the end we saw two non-Jews fighting and he got involved. We, we see the power of Moshe Rabbeinu. It didn't make a difference who it was. If he saw an injustice done, he would jump on it. He, 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 would, he would take on the leadership position. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu was picked. And that's why we have that's, that's why the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh, the mitzvah of sanctifying the moon, sanctifying time, was given to the Jewish people now. That's why it was the first mitzvah given, because first the Jews had to be going free first, because when you're a slave, time doesn't play much of a factor, and therefore you wouldn't be able to appreciate all the free time. And, and, that's, and in fact, you know, society in general, we don't appreciate free time. There's even a colloquial saying we say, you know, a person has like three hours before he has to do something. Oh, let's kill time, isn't it? And that's exactly what you're doing. You're killing life. Because imagine someone on a bus every five minutes threw out a $10 bill. You know he has a contempt for money. He's wasting good money. He's throwing it out. So to someone who's sitting there throwing out, Every hour he's, he's throwing out three hours of his time, he's showing a contempt for he doesn't appreciate the value of time, of opportunity. And Moshe Rabbeinu, that's why we find by Moshe, by Moshe, Moshe, he reached, his, he reached the full potential as one possibly can. We know Avram came pretty close. Avram Zakin Baba Yomim. Avram was Zakin and he lived to a full amount every day he used. And that's why says by Sarah as well, 127 years. Kulan Shav and Latova, of course, they weren't all Latova in terms of she went through many different things. Her son was almost killed. But from each thing, was, they saw an opportunity and that's why she lived She lived the fullest and that's why for she lived the full 127 years and that's why the Medra says Esther was Zoha to, um, we were to the 127 provinces. And that's what the concept of Kiddush HaChodesh is all about. It's the first mitzvah given to sanctify time. And it's a time of renewal. The moon is always compared to Klai Yisrael. And just like we know historically speaking, it always, the, the moon is always waxing bigger and smaller. So too Klai Yisrael. Many times they look on the brink of extermination and many anti-Semites would like that. But just when you think Klai Yisrael is destroyed, the moon comes out again, Kaiser will survive. In fact, that's a famous saying of Mark Twain and others. All the big, all the nations were around and now they're all gone, but this tiny little nation, the Jews stick around. And that's the greatest proof to God is the Jewish people. And that's what the Gemara tells us that there were, we know the Gemara compared to 70 nations, to 70 wolves, and the Jews are the sheep. So one rabbi said to another, How great is the sheep? It survived the 70 wolves. And the rabbi said, no, you got it all wrong. Ha magado ha roa. Now, how great is the sheep? How great is the shepherd? That God maneuvered them in, in between, in between, and directing the sheep, directing Kaiser how to survive. As what the moon represents, historically speaking, is 
that's the history of the Jewish people as well as an individual basis as well they point out that the moon is a reflection and that's why Yoshua who was the greatest Talmud of Moshe Rabbeinu and it wasn't because he was a Baal Machadish it wasn't because he was making different Kiddushim but he was able to reflect and learn from his Rebbe and able to transmit it over the Moshe the Yoshua Kib, Moshe Kibo Torah got Moshe got the Torah um, Yoshua Yoshua had the power of the reflection he was able to give it over you, you don't always have to be you don't have to be the originator you can be creative in putting things together as well and that's the concept of the moon that the moon is Doma Takai Yisrael in terms of historically speaking and as well as an individual basis and that's why the moon was given it wasn't given right away but now that the Jews are about to go free and they're a nation and they're about to partake of the Paschal Lamb, the Karban Pesach, so now's the time for the Jewish people to get the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh and learn now that they become free, they can learn the value of time. Parsha's bow deals with the mitzvah of Karban Pesach, the mitzvah of the Paschal Lamb. And Actually, Karban Pesach is unique. That in the midst of Bris Mila, which incidentally we'll be discussing about the Yenida Mila to eat the Karban Pesach, are two mitzvahs ase. Normally, if you don't fulfill a positive commandment like wearing tefillin or hearing shofar, so there's no own, there's no punishment per se. You just nullify a positive commandment and it was a Beis HaMikdash, you'd bring a a carbon a sacrifice but Mila and carbon Pesach are different those are two mitzvahs that if you do not fulfill you are high of kares you are cut off different um, it's unclear exactly what kares means whether your kids die young you die young but either it's something um, something not a good situation to be high of kares it's a serious matter in halacha and therefore um, one has to be meticulous in bringing the Karban Pesach as well as, as we'll see, um, the Bris Mila. So it says, but in Pasuk, in, in Pasuk Perak Yud Beis, Pasuk Mem Gebo, Vayomar Hashem O Moshe, Zos Chukas HaPesach called Ben Neicha Lo Yochabo, Ben Neicha, either a Gentile can't partake or a Jew who does who the mummer, who the mummer lava the Zara doesn't keep the mitzvahs. Then it goes on different psukim and a couple of psukim later writes we call Aro Lo Yochabo. And an Aro, someone who is uncircumcised, cannot partake in the Karban Pesach. So I want to spend a little time today discussing exactly what is the definition of an Aro. Who exactly is an Aro? Does that mean a Jew who doesn't have a Mila, is he considered an Aro? Or is he considered a Maho? And, and are there any differences regarding eating Truma, the Karban Pesach, or to being fit to be a Moho yourself? So there's a famous Sugyan Avodah Zorah and Avchav Zayin which also talks about a woman being a Mohel but that's not tonight's topic the Gemara talks about why is a non-Jew the Gemara tells us a Gentile is not permitted to do a circumcision so the Gemara says where do you learn it out from one of the Psukim the Gemara learns out from is Himo Yimo the double language the Hamo Yimo that the Haino de Mishu Mo Kashalomo Acherim. Aval Aro Pasalomo. The Gemara learns out someone who has a circumcision themselves, so they could do a meal on someone else. But if you don't have a circumcision, so then, so Himo Yimo, you must have a meal yourself in order to um, you do a circumcision. And it's all discussion over there. What is it? Himo Yimo, maybe. 
maybe it's someone has to be within the tribe, within it, within the Jew. But the Gemara concludes over there that you, a guy can't do it. The question is why not? So it says, Himo Yimo, that is one who has to be a bar milo, whether he ha- um, has to it has the potential to do milo on someone else. So the question the Gemara over the air address is, what about a Yisro Aro Shemesu Achav Machmas Mila? So, someone who doesn't have a circumcision, but not for his own doing, he'd love to do the mitzvah of Mila. He's not rebelling against God, against Judaism. He can't do a Mila because the Halacha tells him not to do a Mila. Who would the Halacha tell not to do a Mila? It says, Yimo there's a biblical commandment on the eighth day, all things being equal, you do a bris on the eighth day. A filo So why can't this person do a mila? So Gemara tells us about someone meisu achiv machmas mila. Someone whose brothers had passed away, they did the mila, they couldn't stop the bleeding, it was a hemophiliac, and therefore they don't want to do a mila on this person because the concern is they won't be able to stop the bleeding and therefore who he will die. So therefore, the halacha says it's a sakana, it's a danger. Not, you're not, not only is there no, no mitzvah, it's usher for you, you're prohibited to do the mila if it's going to put yourself in danger. And in fact, it's a question, perhaps even if you go ahead and did the mila, whether it counts, because like it's a famous Rav Chaim by Tainus that Someone who's a chola, someone who's a chola and, and exempt from the fast. So even if you, so if you, even if you decide to fast anyway, you don't listen. You're not considered someone who is a misana. Like so you can't get an aliyah on the fast day. So perhaps here also, it's a discussion in the commentators. Even if a person went ahead and did a meal, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe you still would be considered an Aro. You wouldn't be considered a Mo because Allah says you can't do a meal. So we'll come back to that. But so the question is, who's considered an Aro? Is it the mere fact that you're uncircumcised? Does that make you an Aro? Or does it have to do with why you're not doing a circumcision? So that's the Gemara's discussion over there about so the Gemara concludes the Yisrael and Dikra Mo Afa Pi Shaloma. The Gemara in Abad Uzzara in that context in talking about whether someone could do a meal on someone else. The Gemara's context is a woman. It's, it's a whole discussion about a woman. It's a machokis in the Gemara whether a woman could be a Moel. I Pasuk and Shmo says, Vatikach Sipora, Sipora did it to the, to the Gemara, gives different reasons according to that opinion. How could Sipora do it? It's a machogas in the Gemara. We assume, well, halacha, if push comes to shove, there's no man, a woman is kosher limo. And the Gemara concludes over there, someone whose brothers died, Machmas Mila, he's Nikra Mol. So we see regarding the Gemara of Azara, regarding the ability of Himo Yimo, even though you personally did not have a Miwa, you're still no longer considered an Aro, and therefore you're able to um, do a Miwa on someone else. It reminds me of an interesting tshuva from Rav, where Rav Wozner, the Shevet Halevi. He talks about this uh, whole discussion of laser circumcision. The whole problems with it, whether you need, it's Koach Adam, you yourself have to do it, you need to have blood coming out. So, again, all things being equal, we do not do a laser surgery. We don't use a laser mila. However, let's say in this, there's a discussion if there's a hemophiliac and the issue of blood, whether you could do a laser surgery. So the Sheva Levi has an interesting distinction. If you do a laser mila, a laser circumcision on this person, on this hemophiliac, so even though he doesn't get the mitzvah of Mila, because he's assuming a laser doesn't cut it, so to speak, you have to have a knife, you have to have some other instrument to do the Mila, not, a laser doesn't work, maybe it's not your own koach, whatever the issue is, he assumes laser surgery doesn't work. 
However, it's enough that you're no longer considered an Oro. You're no longer considered uncircumcised. And it makes an interesting distinction. Hence, you would not make the bracha of al but he says you can't make the bracha of Nisa, Babiso, Sha'avram, Avino. You're no longer an Oro. You're in, you're in with Avram, Avino. So we see from the Shevet Alevi, interesting that it goes by physically speaking. As long as you don't have the Oro, if you don't, if you, if you don't have the foreskin, so then you're not considered an Oro. It goes by the physical status of the body. However, that is a major point of contention, and we see from this Gemara, Meso Achiv Machmas Mila. Even though the person has a Mila, he's not considered an Oro. And However, we have another Gemara which seems to say in the other direction. It's the Gemara in Yavamos. The Mishnah in Yavamos says, and I think the Ayin, Tanana, it says, Aro lo yocho betruba. Someone who's an Aro cannot partake in eating Truma. Because Truma, you have to be a Kohen and you have to have a, you have to be Gamal, you have to have a Miwa. So it's Perish Rashi. What are we talking about? An Oro lo Yochobo. What do you mean? Who can't eat Truma? Of course, and we know that. So what is the, come, what is the Mishnah telling me? The Ayri, so the Rashi says, Ba'ayri ba'aro shomeso achiv machmas mila sheino ochel betruma v'pesach So Rashi writes over there an Oro. Who's an Oro? Someone whose brothers died because of the mila and if he's not allowed to have a mila so even he cannot partake of the Achilles Truma, eating the Truma, or Aro Yochabo, he can't partake of the Karban Pesach. So we see from over here, on this Rashi, that someone who is not Gamal, even if it's not for rebellious reasons, Allah tells me, he still has the status of an Aro, and therefore you can't eat Truma Maisa. So we seem to have an apparent Contradiction from the Gemara in Avodah Zarah, we see as someone who's Mesiv Achiv Machmas Mila. He doesn't have an Aro, but he's considered Himo. He's considered in the tribe, and he's permitted to Gamal. You know, he still could be a Moel. However, from the Gemara in the Mishnah in Yavamis Tavayin, someone who's an Aro Mesiv Achiv Machmas Mila, he cannot eat Truma. And he can't eat, partake of the carbon pesos. How do we reconcile the two? However, before we reconcile, this opinion of Rashi isn't accepted by all. We show him do hold like Rashi, but Rabbi Tam disagrees. Rabbi Tam paskins over there in the Gemara in Yavamas. The Meso Achiv Machmas Mila Eno Nikra Oro Klau. He's not considered an Oro at all. The kasha lomo, and he's allowed to give a do a circumcision on someone else. Well, the ms yachol achol betruma, he can eat truma the pesach. It's only a mumo aralos yesh lomar. This over Rabbi Tam, and Rabbi Tam only someone who's a mumar on purpose. He's the one who you can't eat. And that's a machokas in the rishonim whether that's true. So according to Rabbi Tam, at least he's consistent. He's consistent that an, someone who is Mesiv Achiv Machmas Miwa, and that's why he's not having a Miwa, he's not considered an Oro, for either to, to be a Mohel or regarding Achilles Truma and a regarding um, Pesach. What's, this, the, what's the lumdus here of Rabbi Tam? What's his Machokas here? Rashi Rabbi Tam this whole issue in terms of whether someone who can't have a Mila because it's a danger, whether he has a status of an Oro or not. So, there's a famous Kasha, the Mepharshim asks, and based on this famous Kasha, we'll explain based on a Briskarav, a Yerushalmi, and this Tosis. This, we'll just go back a step and we'll, and we'll answer up the question. So there's a famous question the Mepharshim ask is if we have a tradition in the Medrashim that the Avos kept Kola Torah Kuo and you, the Gemara Yubi even spells out Avraham 
even before it was given. So the question all the Mepharshim ask is, so why is it when it came to the mitzvah of Mila, Avraham waited to be commanded? So the simple answer is because a bris involves two people, and you can't do a bris on your own. There's a famous answer of the Mara Diskin, the Vilna Gon, that we have a principle in the Gemara, Gadol HaMetzuva V'yoseh Mishaina Metzuva V'yoseh. Greater is the one who does the mitzvah is commanded than one who volunteers, even though it might sound counterintuitive. However, the issue is it's much harder to do something when you're forced. But if I volunteer, it's much easier. So, of course, um, in terms of... So, therefore, that's what it means, Tosis writes over there, that it's much harder to do, and therefore it's more reward. So, what does that have to do with anything? So, by other mitzvahs, you could do it many times, so therefore... You, you could do it before you're commanded. I could put on tefillin after I'm commanded. But me was a one-time shot. You only could do the mitzvah once. So Avram wanted to do it with the greatest, uh, the, the most appropriate way when he was commanded so he could fulfill the mitzvah of Torah's mitzvah v'yoseh while he's commanded. However, a third answer, the one we want to focus on is the briskarov is why did Avram wait to be commanded? Because the question is, what is considered an oral? So the way the Shevet HaLevi learns and others learn is, it's a physical thing. As long as you didn't cut off the foreskin, you have the status of an oral. You know, whether you, whether Mesa Ochel Machmas Mila, that's a separate question. But let's say a person doesn't, a, a person doesn't cut off the foreskin, he's considered an oral. But let's say a person does, let's say, Avram would have cut off the foreskin before he was commanded in the midst of Nila. So the Briskarov points out he was still could be considered an Oro. In other words, there was no concept of Oro until there's a midst of Nila. The midst of Nila creates the status of an Oro. It's not just a physical thing that you have it on your body, but it's the midst of Nila. That's why he points out right after Avram was given the midst of Nila, by Yipo Aponav, he went down and says, I can't stand in the presence of God, I'm incomplete. Ah, he spoke to God many times, and he didn't feel that way, because right now the mitzvah of Mila was given, and now once the, Mila, once the mitzvah of Mila was given, hence the status of an Oro. And that's the, that's the Machokas, I just quoted you, the Machokas, Rashi Rabbein Otam. Let's say someone can't have a Mila because of halachic reasons, is, Hemophilia, he's a hemophilia. So Rashi writes, okay, it's not his fault, he's an honor, but he's still considered an Aro, and therefore, he can't eat Truma, and he can't partake of the carbon Pesach. And Rabbi Atam says, no, he's not an Aro. So what's the Nakuda Tamachokas? So, the issue, so there are different ways of learning it, but one way, but you could say everyone agrees the mitzvah of Mila creates the obligation of a status of being an Oro. According to Rabbi Tam, he doesn't have a mitzvah. Since the halacha says, I'm not chayah, so it's like I was never commanded. If I wasn't commanded, so I'm not an Oro. However, Rashi learns to know. Either he can agree with that lamdis and say that it's true, but he was commanded. He, I'm, I am commanded, I just can't do it, and therefore I keep the status of an Oro. So we see someone who's operating in the midst of Mila, that creates the status of an Oro, and that's why the famous, Rabbi Tom could have got up in the famous Yerushalmi and Shabbos. We know that a Kohen Oro, he can't be, he can't get benefit from the Truma. So the Yerushalmi discusses, however, during the first couple of days, you're permitted to anoint the child with Shem and Shel Truma. But once day eight comes, you can't. Why? Because the Yusham is assuming the Chiyav and Brisvi doesn't begin until day eight, so it's a mitzvah of Milo, creates the status of an Oro. Up until then, you can get benefit. Uh, but day eight already, it's, it's us. So the child of Yusham has, what about the night of day eight? On the one hand, you don't do, you don't do a mitzvah at night, so do I say bad from the mitzvah begins the, the eighth or night except I can't do it to the next morning or no or the mitzvah doesn't begin to the next day. So that's the, what the Yushami is mistook about. What the doubt of the Yushami is on the night of day eight 
That seems to be the Machokas here, Rashi Rabbeinu Tam. So it comes out, so according to Rabbeinu Tam, it seems to fit in well that someone who is a ma- uh, someone who is Mesa B'Achil Machabas Bila, he's not considered an Oro. Not he's permitted to be a Mohel, as the Gemara tells us in Avada Zara. And according to Rabbeinu Tam, only talking about an Oro intentional. But an Oro who is out of, under the rest, Mesu Akhil Machmas Mila, he's permitted to eat Truma and um, partake of the Karban Pesach. However, according to Rashi, how do we reconcile the apparent contradiction? Why is by, by an Aro, by being a Moel, we say it's good, he's not an Aro, he's considered a Moho. However, regarding the issue of Mesu Akhil Machmas Mila, regarding Truma, eating Truma, and Karban Pesach, we say he can't eat. So, there are a couple of approaches. One approach is based on Tosis and Yavamas. Ayin Aleph, Devre Hamaskyo, Vinim Molin. So, Tosis writes, The Ein Lahakshos, the Torah says, Vachol Oro lo Yochobo, the Hugo Itzarach El Yisro. What do we need the Pasuk of? So the Marisha explains Tosis. What is Tosis' question? Tosis' question is like this. The Hare Yisrael, Yeshul Shei Moho, a Jew, has the status of a Moho. Even if he's not come out. Then came Adul Indian Pesach, Nikra Aro. So they have a why, like the Gemara of the Zara. So why? Regarding carbon Pesach, it's considered an Aro. So Tosis answers, the cave the Nachri Nizmai Mikra, the Ben Nechel Yochabo. We already excluded a Gentile from the Pasuk of Kol Ben Nechel Yochabo. Therefore, we have an extra Pasuk of the Chol Aro. What is it coming to teach me? Lumai Yisrael, the Afagab, the Nikra Mo, Mikom Akum Agabi Pesach Nikra Aro. So the way the Marsha explains Tosis really. Really, the luck is a Yisrael, even in the Yisrael Aro is considered a Moel, and that's why the luck is we permit him to be a Moel. It's only because we have a special Pasuk, the whole Aro Lo Yochavo, it's a Chiddush, it's a special Xeris HaKosov, when it comes to the Garb Karban Pesach, that we learn out that he's considered the Karban Pesach, he's considered Aro by Karban Pesach, and perhaps by Truma as well. That's one explanation. That's just based on the Psukim. However, maybe we can make a difference in Lamdis. Yesh Teretz Ba'ov and Acher. That so the so the commentators explain as follows: The Ine Yisrael Shalom Mo after after Yesh Lo Shem Moho there ain't Eno Oro Kachol Agayim Shinabahem Kol Gayim Arelim. Even though he's not, he's considered um, he has a Shem Moho. I'm not a Revada Yesh Lo Arla Vehu Mechayev Limo, but he still has. He still has an Aro, physically speaking, and he has an obligation to do the Mila. The neighbor Mila Nemar Himo Yimo. The Darshu Shiyamo Bechtesha Kasha Limo. So it seems the Torah is this Machbid Rakshi Bo Shem Moho. So when it comes to the, uh, the status of someone being a Mohel, so as long as Himo Yimo, as long as you have the status of a Moho, even though, strictly speaking, you're an Aro, nevertheless, like Meso Akumach Mila, you still consider the Mo, and therefore you can do the Mila. However, we, the status of Aro by Carbon Pesach and Truma is different. It says, Behold, Aro, Bo Yochobo. The Torah is Makbech, Lo Yebo Shum Shemet Areilas. You shouldn't have any, even, even, even any remembrance, nothing, you shouldn't be an Aro at all. The low dive Mamash Yesh Go Shemo. And therefore it doesn't say the Khal Sha Eno Nimo Go Yochobo. And Lafiza, now we can understand maybe that's Pshad and Rashi. The Khiwak Ben Mila by Mila where if if you're a Meso Akhamakma Smila Kosha Limo, what Bet Pesak Sha also echo but Pesak Mashum because by Mila the Torah is disinterested that you have a Shemo. You could have a you could have a Shemo even though you're strictly speaking Still have an oro. However, by, by Pesach, the Torah is marked with a whole oro lo yochobo, and therefore it's not enough to have a shemo, and perhaps that's the distinction. So that's the that's part of the whole issue here of what is the status of a mo, 
what's the status of an oral that this goes by physically having a mall we have the Machok is Rashi we know Tom whether a Meso Achlamach Masmila is a mall at all is an oral at all Rashi says he is an oral Agabe Karban Pesach because either a special Pasuk or because the Torah is more Machbid not to be an oral but not a Shein Maho and we have this um, so, we, so we have this distinction in terms of um, whether it's the mitzvah milah that creates the shame mo, that could also be as a, um, as a shayla in terms of a ger. Someone who converts to Judaism, one of the things you need is milah and tefillah. So what happens if you're a guy, but you're a hemophiliac, and therefore a pihalacha, it's a sakana to do the milah. So you can't do the milah. So could this person become a convert? So... You know, so Rav Chaim um, Rav Chaim Paskins know that in order to be a convert, you have to go through the status of a Mila. So we see that he's still considered an Aro that by a guy a, you know, by a guy it could be different, but it could be, maybe you could, you know, um, I'll be I'm not arguing, but the lambda, those who argue Rav Chaim Shmulevitz could argue and say, no, maybe you can. Because what's the issue? The issue is if it's the mitzvah of Mila that creates the status of an Aro, if you assume it is, and then Samachok is Rashi, according to Rabbi Tam, perhaps this person would not be obligated in the mitzvah of Mila, and therefore all he would need is Tzfil and other things. But all these issues about, um, about Avram Avinu not, being, not circumcising himself before being commanded, the issue of a child before day eight or on the night of day eight, the issue of a hemophiliac with laser circumcision maybe no longer has the status of an Aro, but he still has not fulfilled the mitzvah uh, of Mila. And the distinction we have between being an Aro, according to Rabbi Tam, if you're if you don't have a Mila because your brother has died, you're hemophiliac, so you're not considered you consider the shame all for everything. However, according to Rashi, you're only considered a mole to be a molel, but regarding Truma and Karban Pesach, it's usur to eat, and that's because either because it's a special zero sarkasif we have by Karban Pesach, or because similarly the Torah is makbid b'cho orogo yochobo, but regarding being a molel, it's just a simo yimo, so we're not, as long as you um, have the status of a shemo, even though you have, even though even though you're in, even though you haven't necessarily fulfilled um, your mitzvah of Mila.